Good morning. On the eve of India's general elections, an unnecessary controversy has been created at the highest level by the Modi government around Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who passed away 40 years ago. An allegation has been made that when in power, she compromised India's sovereignty, gave away an Indian island to Sri Lanka for nothing in return. While this allegation is being responded to by the Congress President and Mr. Chidambaram of the Congress, what I intend to tell the viewers is who exactly Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was insofar as India's external threats were concerned, insofar as India's defense was concerned, that she was absolutely a class apart, incomparable to any of the Prime Ministers that India has had. So what I'll do is I have picked up five issues that happened when she was in power and I'll talk of them in a chronological fashion. The first we know was the 1971 India-Pakistan war which led to the creation of Bangladesh. So by March of 1971, it was clear to the Prime Minister that the influx, the huge influx of refugees coming from East Pakistan to India was unstoppable and it was creating a lot of problems for India. Something drastic had to be done. Therefore, on the 28th April 1971, she summoned a special cabinet meeting where the chief of army staff, who was also the chairman chiefs of staff committee, General Sam Manikshaw, was invited. And the prime minister told the cabinet and the army chief present there that look, something drastic needs to be done and that has to be a war with Pakistan to stop the influx of the refugees into India. Once she had made the proposal, all eyes were on Sam Manikshaw for his response. The army chief said that I, will, I won't go to war right now. I need minimum six months to go to war. And he gave two reasons for that. But before I talk of the two reasons, let me inform the viewers that in those days, and especially when she was the Prime Minister of India, there was a conversation. There was a to and fro between the Prime Minister and the Army Chief, unlike the present time, where the Prime Minister tells the three service chiefs what exactly is their operational role. But coming back to what we were talking, the two reasons given by Sam Manikshaw was, they were that Prime Minister from June to October is the monsoon season in East Pakistan, when one third of that whole area will be under water and operations will be very difficult during monsoon season. And the second reason he said is that I need preparatory time to make up the shortfalls of my strategic sustenance for the campaign. He was referring to the spares, the assemblies and the ammunition. That was all the things were required. The prime minister accepted his proposal, but gave one term of reference of her own to the army chief. And she told the army chief, all right, one thing you have to keep in mind when you prepare your plan and bring it for my final approval, that the war has to be a short one. I do not want a long war. And what she had in mind was she was fully aware of the nexus between China and Pakistan. And she also knew about the military alliance between Americans and the Pakistanis. So she knew that a lot of pressure will come in case the war is elongated. Therefore, the plan that came up finally for the Prime Minister's approval was that the Indian military will focus only on East Pakistan. As far as West Pakistan was concerned, that will be held in a defensive mode and Sam Manikshaw gave clear instructions to the Western Army Commander General Kendeth that you simply hold the front on the western side. And the reason why this plan was made was very simple. Sam Manikshaw was fully aware that the Pakistan army was not a walk in the park. And any campaign, any offensive action in the Western Front will lead to a long war. It cannot remain a short war. And as far as East Pakistan was concerned, he was also conscious of the fact 
that it is impossible for any country leave Pakistan for any country to maintain its forces across thousands of kilometers of hostile airspace. It is not possible. So in any case, as far as the uh, East uh, Pakistan was concerned, it was really a lost case. Now, before I come to the actual war, what the Prime Minister was suspecting that came true. News came that in July 1971, Henry Kissinger, he made a secret visit with the help of Pakistan to China. Now what this meant was that here is a triangle which had been formed. And precisely what she had suspected would happen, that an enormous pressure would come from this triangle, triangle of America, Pakistan and China. While she had already been considering various options of what to do, India on the 9th of August 1971 signed the Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation with the Soviet Union. This was not a military alliance. It was not a military partnership. It was not that India will work with Soviet Union and get in their defense networks. It was simply a convergence of national interests. So when the war started, as the plan was, and as the way it was to happen, it ended in 13 days. <clears throat> Sorry, the war started on 3rd of December and on 16th of December, with the signing of the instrument of surrender by General Niazi, who was in charge of the overall forces, Pakistani forces in East Pakistan, the campaign was lost for Pakistan and Bangladesh was created. And the Prime Minister was bang on once again insofar as her suspicion regarding the external pressure was concerned because in the month of December, a task force of the US 7th Fleet, which is, which is based in Japan, it was seen in the Bay of Bengal. The whole idea was to intimidate the Indian side and to undo their campaign for the liberation of, uh, for the creation of Bangladesh. And as had been planned, the Soviets also dispatched two nuclear armed fortiners. With two superpowers in the region, they could take care of each other and the matter was finished. So this is precisely what the war was. And Bangladesh was created and, the, and this honor of creating Bangladesh goes to the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi at that time and to the military leadership of the time and the brave soldiers. Now, there are a lot of issues which came up after the war, where a lot of controversy has been created by mostly BJP supporters. I will refer to two of them. One, it is being said that when we created Bangladesh, we won the war. Why wasn't the ceasefire line made into an international border? And why into another line called the line of control? Well, the answer is simple. As I had said earlier, people should know that the Pakistan army was not defeated in the West. And when the Shimla agreement was to be signed in Shimla in July of 1972, where Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto of Pakistan were there, it was very clear, Bhutto told Mrs. Gandhi that at this stage, I cannot accept this to become an international border because the Pakistan army will not accept this. So best what could be done is, and which was done is, that there was a give and take of territory and the ceasefire line was made into a line of control. And I think the big achievement of the Shimla agreement was that both sides agreed that bilaterally we will resolve our problems as well as the issue of Kashmir. So this was the takeaway of the war. Bilat bilateralism was introduced and Bangladesh was created. But the controversy didn't stop at this. Now there are a lot of people who say that when India had 93,000 prisoners of war of the Pakistanis in East Pakistan, that was enough sizable force 
to put pressure on the Pakistan military in the West to surrender and to accept the condition that the military line be made into an international border. Again, they are wrong. And the reason is that, first of all, 93,000 were not prisoners of war. The prisoner of war or the soldiers were around 80,000. The rest were civilians. And as Sam Manikshaw rightly told the Prime Minister at that time, that as far as prisoners of war are concerned, they never make into good soldiers again. Which means as far as the Pakistan army was concerned, they were a complete washout. And he was proved right subsequently. Because once these prisoners of war, which were an unnecessary burden, they were treated well by the Indian side and they went back to Pakistan. The Pakistan army disbanded those three divisions which had lost the war in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. And instead in 1973, the Pakistan army raised six new divisions. So when we look at the overall 1971 campaign, what comes out very clearly is that Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was not intimidated and was not in awe of the American leadership. It was the other way around. They were in awe of the Indian Prime Minister, something which does not happen or has not happened when the BJP governments have been in power, whether the Bajpai government or the present government. I'll just come to that in a while with my second instance, big thing that happened under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And they were the 1974 nuclear tests done in Pokhran. It was done by the Indian Army over the uh, under the overall supervision of the then director of the Bhava Atomic Research Center, Dr. Raja Ramanna. Now, these tests were done. They were successful. Raja Ramanna called up the prime minister and the code word was Buddha is smiling. So it was smiling Buddha. That means they have been accomplished. Now, what India did was again a very strategic move. They did not call it a nuclear test. Because the yield was so low, it is being said that the yield was around 11 to 13 kiloton. It was called a peaceful nuclear explosion. Now, any test where the yield does not exceed 150 kilotons can be labeled as a peaceful nuclear explosion, something that the Soviets and the Americans had been doing in the 50s. And the purpose of a nuclear nuclear peaceful explosion is they can be used for making canals, they can be used for electricity generation, they can be used for a lot of non-military purposes. While the Americans and the world were very clear that what India is calling as peaceful nuclear explosions were actually testing of the fission device and the sanctions were also put on India, but India somehow managed to convey to the world. I mean, there was nothing to boast about. The objective was met and that was it. So it was called peaceful nuclear explosion. Now compare this with the second explosion done by the Bajpayee government in May of 1998. When we know that five nuclear tests were done by the Bajpayee government on two days on 11th of May and 13th of May. And it was said immediately after that, that India now has become a nuclear weapon state. Now, a lot of issues came up after that. Because the biggest issue was that the prime minister did the test. And if it was actually to strengthen the deterrence of India, what was the need for him to write a personal letter to the American president, Bill Clinton, telling them, that the reason for India test, China was the reason as well as the nexus between China and Pakistan. It was very obvious that the Bajpayee government simply wanted to cozy up with the Americans. And that is something that did not happen. Because Bill Clinton got furious. That letter we know was leaked to the New York Times. And once it was leaked, the Chinese came to know and in June itself, June of 1998, <coughs> President Clinton 
had a week long visit to china which was planned and the indian should have known about it now in that visit the americans asked the chinese to oversee the peace and stability in south asia the chinese were made responsible and it is the chinese also who at the behest <coughs> sorry with full support of the americans they did the they came up with this un resolution 1172 which made it very clear that india and pakistan under the npt will not be accepted as nuclear weapon states and they had to do away with their nuclear weapons so so much for india's nuclear test this is not all what happened after that was because china was named by the bajpai government so the violations on the line of actual control they started because as we know that the line of actual control which used to be a border when prime minister indira gandhi was there it became the line of actual control in 1993 again a blunder done by the narsimha rao government just to prove that his visit to um, uh, to china was a huge success but that's a different story so the violations on the line of control intrusions they increased many fold next the nuclear nexus between pakistan and china it started strengthening and it became more overt with the result that today pakistan has a nuclear full deterrence capability full sorry full spectrum deterrence it has that means at all the three levels it has a deterrence in place a nuclear deterrent in place what is the implication of that the implication is that today india faces as far as pakistan is concerned a deterrence at two levels at the conventional level and at the nuclear level which was absolutely unnecessary because the first tests done by prime minister indira gandhi were good enough because the test by the done by the bajpai government a lot of senior scientists they put a question mark over the thermonuclear device whether it was actually it worked or not so everything was really limited to the fission tests but so when i say two levels what it means is that first of all there was a difficulty of creating a nuclear a de- conventional deterrence with pakistan and now another layer was added to that so this is exactly what happened as far as the second thing is concerned now the third big event which not many people know about is prime minister indira gandhi's dealing with china now we know that in 1976 when she was in power she was the prime minister india had full diplomatic relations with china they were established so before they were established in 1976 two things were done one is that a china study group was created under the chairmanship of k r narayana a foreign service officer who later became the president of india and under his chairmanship what was done is on the instructions of the prime minister the patrolling policy against china at that time it was still a disputed border it was worked out mind you the patrolling policy that means the patrolling points which we keep hearing now these days this word now patrolling points they this policy basically meant that till where the indian patrols will go on the disputed border and this was done in 1975 please remember at that time the infrastructure was very weak on the indian side as well as on the chinese side so the patrolling points were well inside so the big question that came up as i said after india bajpai government did their nuclear test in may 1998 was i said that the pla violations of the line of actual control they increased many fold the big issue was which i asked mr george fernandez who was the defense minister in the bajpai government after his retirement and after the fall of the bajpai government i asked him i said why exactly i mean you said that china is india's number one threat you named it when the government was still in power and why is it that you did not revise the 
petroling limits. Why only the 1975 limits? Because after all, certain amount of infrastructure more had been built up. They should have been revised. And his answer to me was, he is no more now. He told me, which, we, which I have written in an article in Force magazine, he said that I do not decide the petroling policy. It is de decided by the entire cabinet. Basically, the Bajpai government did not want to unnecessarily create trouble with China. They were too scared to revise the petroling policy. Well, in 1976, full diplomatic relations, as I said, they were established. After that, something very important happened. And it was that when Mrs. Indira Gandhi came back as the Prime Minister in 1980, the then Army Chief, General Krishna Rao, approached the Prime Minister with two proposals. One, he said, that learning the lessons from the 1962 war, he said, what we need to do is, I want to have a 15-year plan which he called Operational Falcon. In that plan, what I want to do is, I want to do a forward build-up. A forward build-up, not as isolated posts, but with due and regular infrastructure development along with the lines of communications. This was the plan. And the second thing what he asked the Prime Minister was that there is a need to review the operational stance of the Indian Army against the PLA, against China. Now, a big thing which was always on the mind of the Indian commanders until the 1962 war is that Sela and Bomdila, which are at heights, Sela is at a height of about 13,000 feet, that they should be held in force. This was the whole operational stance, that the focus should be on Sela and Bomdila. In fact, I remember in 1977, when I was posted at Sela, I went to Sela as a young officer, even I was baffled as a young officer as to why so much of territory is ahead and why is it that we have to hold this line. So the suggestion made by the army chief, then army chief, General Rao, was that we need to push the whole mass forward and make Tawang as the center for Kemeng district and Walong for the Lohit district. These two things were suggested. Now the only questions that prime minister asked the army chief was that will this lead to war and do you think China will use nuclear weapons? And his response was, Madam Prime Minister, I do not know. A war may happen. Whether China will use nuclear weapons or not, I cannot say that. But the Prime Minister said, okay, doesn't matter. We will see when the situation happens. You go ahead with this plan. I know all this because I had a long interview with General K.B. Krishna Rao when he was alive and it is there in the FOSS magazine. Now, in fact, when the 1986 Somdrongchuk crisis happened, at that time the Army Chief General Sundarji, he made use of this new operational stance where the entire mass had moved to Tawang. And he also made use of the infrastructure which had been developed for six uh, years from 1980 to 1986. So the point to make here is that the Chinese were aware of all this, what was happening under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And then they also saw that in April of 1975, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi made Sikkim into a state of the Union of India. When so many things they were seeing, they saw how she guided or how she oversaw the 1971 campaign. They saw her making Sikkim as a state of the union. They saw what they had, the instructions that were given to the Indian army because they could see it on the ground. And they saw the patrolling policy. They saw all this. So in 1984, it was the last time when the supreme leader of China, Deng Xiaoping, through an emissary, he invited Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to come to China and offered the same package, a give and take, which was offered by Chao Enlai earlier in 59. 
of course mrs gandhi could not make it to china and she was assassinated so the point i am making is that her handling of china was so precise and accurate that the chinese were impressed and the reason for that was that she understood a few basics and the few basics are that when you are tackling adversaries where there is a disputed border or there is a military line you never negotiate from a position of weakness you negotiate only from a position of military strength and the second thing what she learned was which was on display is that if you negotiate from a position of weakness at best it will lead to some tactical gains and at worst it will lead to hardening of positions precisely what is happening with china now please recall in 2015 when prime minister modi went to china he visited xian there publicly he told the chinese president xi jinping that the two countries need to uh, see how the line of actual control works and we need to decide that on the ground and of course the chinese president did not respond at all because the chinese don't have any intentions of doing that and today we have a hardening of position on especially the indian side as well as the chinese side they are also not giving up so these are basic things about understanding military power now i'll come to the fourth subject now the fourth thing that happened concerning national security and defense and deterrence when prime minister indira gandhi was in par was that she sanctioned in 1983 the integrated guided missile defense development program this was a big thing at that time in 1983 and under this plan the drdo was to make a total of five missiles two were ballistic missiles agni and prithvi and two were quick reaction surface to air missiles akash and trishul and the fifth was anti tank missile called nag this is what they were to make and the reason why it was sanctioned by the prime minister are two number 1 by the peaceful nuclear explosion india had already tested the fissile material now what india needed was a vector a delivery system and the delivery system had to be a missile so the focus really in this as far as this plan was concerned was on agni because agni was to have a range of 2500 kilometers and it was given it was not called a missile a program it was called a technology demonstrator and the world knew that when you make a missile with such a range of 2500 kilometers you don't test it with conventional or you don't use it with conventional warhead and you know destroy a couple of buildings in the enemy area it doesn't make sense it has to be used with a nuclear warhead so this was the whole idea so this whole plan was conceived uh, and the prime minister gave the the sanction and the second reason was that prime minister introduced the missiles in south asia it is another story that the drdo failed to keep pace with the missile program they failed to make good progress on the missile program and pakistan managed actually to outpace india in so far as the missile race was concerned with the help of the chinese and of course a lot of the ingenuity and innovation that's a different story now now we come to the fifth thing the fifth thing as we know is siachen which is called operation megdoot which was cleared by prime minister indira gandhi we know that this operation started on 13th april 1984 and continues till this date and the genesis of this operation goes back to the military line between india and pakistan in both cases in 1949 when the ceasefire line was created and in 1972 when the line of control was created it was converted into line of control the northern end was left hanging because it was felt that at the northern end which was a point on the map called nj9842 
both sides did not bother to take it northwards or take it forward because it was said that look in the glaciers the capability does not exist with either country to take a war there which i think in hindsight was a disservice done by military officers of both sides it should have been taken to the northernmost end but it was not done and this is the genesis of the siachen campaign once both the sides they had the capability to do high altitude operations to be on a glacier once it came then the race started for this glacier for the siachen glacier now as far as the genesis is like this this was really a race so the northern army commander at that time was lieutenant general ml chibar and the 15 corps commander under whose jurisdiction this glacier came was lieutenant general p n hoon now they approached prime minister gandhi and she was told that look this is a area and we know that the pakistanis are also preparing to go and occupy this glacier we want to go and occupy it the prime minister gave the go ahead and now a question is to be asked why is it that prime minister indira gandhi gave the political clearance for siachen and the reason was very simple she was clear that a free run in north kashmir in what is called northern areas or what is today called gilgit baltistan a free run by pakistan and china which has been going on right from 40, 1948 has to be stopped instead of being reactive india needed to be active this was the political logic for the prime minister to give the clearance because the world knows that in 1963 an agreement was signed between pakistan and china under which 5000 square kilometers of territory in kashmir was handed over which is the raksham as saksham valley was given to china and that is when china got a physical hold foothold in the kashmir theater so the prime minister wanted to put an end to that it is another matter that these two commanders got their assessment wrong not wrong it was grossly wrong and i'll explain why i spoke with general chibar after he retired and we've done an interview and he told me two things he said that when i started this operation operation megdoot of occupying this uh, glacier the whole idea was that we felt that this will be a very temporary thing that if we can just hold the passes and we can support the passes logistically by air operations by the indian air force that should be enough to signal to the pakistani side that look we are now physically here and they will go back A wrong assessment wrong assumption because it was not appreciated the quantity of threat which will come from pakistan it was not appreciated the staying part that the pakistan army will have and then he said he told me that when we occupied this the area had no strategic significance well he is wrong strategic significance was the prime minister is the prime minister's prerogative and she knew what the strategic significance of that area was and worse he told me it's all there in the interview that he gave me he said that as far as we were concerned there was no plan to occupy this permanently so the entire assumption was wrong and add to this another problem it was not appreciated by both the commanders the top commanders that look high altitude is different from glaciated areas one of the big lessons that came out of the 1962 war was that after the height of 18000 feet it is human endurance that he survives actually nothing works the biggest killer is the climate because the oxygen gets very rare so how exactly they were planning to do this how to sustain this i mean this now they ask me then what was the way out in fact there was a to and fro of articles between in the indian express between what i wrote and what general hoon responded and i said that look at that time 
if the indian military leadership had understood the significance if they had understood what sort of resistance will come from pakistan if they had realized that pakistan is not a walk in the park then instead of occupying the passes we should have occupied the heights which were to the west of the saltoro ridge which is the dhansam plains dhansam is a as is, is at a height of 10000 feet and today of course then it was held very lightly today it is a very strong military garrison of the pakistan army so this is really operation meghdoot just con- which continues till today but as far as prime minister indira gandhi is concerned for the paucity of time because i don't want this video to be very long i just want to put this very clearly i have studied this area for 45 years now and i have followed all the prime ministers and when the military history will be written and in the military history of post independent india the role played by prime ministers will be put prime minister indira gandhi will simply be a class apart thank you very much